Welcome back to another episode and the new series that has actually been suggested by one of our followers. I thought, hey, that's a great idea. Let's do it. Three cars from all the brands that we can think of, and they're gonna be my favorite three designs of this brand, not including any of them I've worked on. The first brand today is going to be a big one. It's going to be Ferrari. Now, I love Ferraris. I think anybody who has anything to do with cars or even a mild passing interest in cars has to love Ferrari. The first car is the Ferrari 365 GT4 BB. Now this car marks a turning point in Ferrari's history of road going cars because it's the first one, actually technically speaking, to have a rear mid engine. Now most cars up to that time have always had their engine in the front in Ferrari's lineup. This car defined, it was sort of a new breed of road going Ferraris because putting an engine behind the driver was done as a response to the Lamborghini Mira. Now that, that design improved the road holding, the road handling characteristics of, of, of a car and so Enzo Ferrari decided we need something to do that. So the car was launched at the Turin Motor Show in 1971, reached production in 73. But what's interesting about this car is the layout of the engine which made use, the shape made use of the fact that it was a boxer engine. Now that means that the engine is laying low and flat and the pistons go out at 180 degrees, so horizontally from each other, which meant that the proportions of the car could be quite a bit lower than, than if it wasn't a boxer type engine. The boxer moved the cabin forward, had the engine directly behind the driver. It was a completely different stance to what Ferraris previously had done. The BB, designation before I get too far into it. There's a lot of uh, you know, controversy to what BB actually stands for. I've always thought it was the Berlinetta Boxer, but I much prefer Leonardo Fioravanti's uh, description, the designer of the car, where he said that actually BB standing for Brigitte Bardo. We all know who she is. Now what I like about the design of this car, specifically this one, because it later also evolved into the 512, which came out I think in the mid 70s, 76 or so it came out. But the 512 BB was actually the successor to the 365. It kind of had that very low bonnet on the front, which was enabled by putting the engine in the back, which gave it more of a, almost more of a wedge look that was starting to get uh, to be the design themes in the 70s. They also used the pop-up headlamp design, which for me is always one of the most beautiful things on, most fascinating things on cars. It's a bit of over design because why would you want to hide the light sometimes and have them pop up? But at the same time, it does give it a very sleek front end design, very clean, and that works really well. And there's a lot of features on the front. I mean, not a very identifiable grill, but it's got the egg crate design, which is very typical of Ferraris, uh, still even to this day. And the Cavallino, obviously, the horse, the horse in the middle down there. And then you get to the back where you have all the power of this uh, mid-engine right there and it's bulging. It's got all the vents on the top uh, for heat soak, for getting heat out of the engine bay. And then you get to the back and you have this very voluptuous rear end, very bulging hips almost. And all that power right there centrally located over the rear wheels almost. So one of the elements that I really believe in cars like this, especially of this, this era, was how they actually emphasize the strength of the car. And you see it most of the time from the rear. What they do is they have the greenhouse come down to the, to the belt line, to the waistline, and then it would actually come out. And that gives you these shoulders that were uh, very prominent on, especially on this car or cars like this, where you had that really wide stance. This car is low and wide, obviously, but it kind of emphasizes it when you can get that shoulder running all the way through the, uh, the side of the car from the rear over the hips into the front and then it fades out through there, but that gives that real proper sports car stance. The wheel lips are very prominent in the rear of this car. They kind of bulge out from the regular surface of the fender, gives it a real wide, wide stance approach from the rear. When you're looking at it, it's almost as if the tires are too big or too wide for the car, so they actually had to bend the, the, the metal outwards and allow that kind of clearance for the rear wheel. 
This car has been released with a number of colors and you know, the blues look very good on this car. For me, because of its sportiness, is probably that red-black combination where it has that black on the bottom, sort of the bottom half of the car and the red on the top. It's a very rich way, a very, very interesting way of making the design still stick together but halving it in such a way that you have this much lighter effect overall to the, uh, to the volume of the vehicle. So this works really well. I like the black-red combination. The mid-engine concept has been used for many years in the, in the racing world before the Boxer came out. And Enzo was able to say, okay, let's, let's go in that direction. And right he was, because this car here is one of the most desirable Ferraris in the history of Ferrari. Next car is a very, very special car for me. For me, it's one of the most beautiful Ferraris ever designed. It's even influenced one of the latest new Ferraris on the market. And I think if people want to be as accurate as possible when they define the Ferrari Roma, look at the influence it's had from this car that I'm gonna to talk to you about. The car is the Ferrari 250 GT Berlinetta Lusso. This car was introduced in 1962 and is as gorgeous as ever, even if you see it today. So before this car, Ferrari never had anything like a racing appendage applied to their road cars. Now, what do I mean by racing appendages? Ferrari's one of those companies, again, that uh, learn from racing and they try to bring that technology into their road cars. It was the first Ferrari that actually included uh, what we call a, a, um, a spoiler on the back, a duck lip, sort of duck tail uh, on the back of the hood, the back of the tail. And that was the first time we've ever seen anything applied to a Ferrari that comes from the racing uh, department in terms of design like that. So what I feel about this car when I look at it is that it is exceptionally striking to look at. It's extremely attractive. Again, no bad angle on this car, but stare at it from the front for a moment and you'll understand that volumes on this car are what make it. The long drawn out sweeping lines of the front of the hood, of the fenders going into the shoulders on the side, one pure line that just continues your eye all the way from front to back. It's a very natural looking volume, very natural looking shapes on this car. You know, this is almost like the ultimate shape you could design for a car to look pure. And one of the things that I really like about this design that, that even today we don't get right is the width of the pillars. Now, obviously we need structure, we need strength for rollover and things like that. But if you can get the pillars to be strong and thin, my gosh, does that do wonders to the design of this car. Even subtle little things, like if you look at the wheel well cutouts where the, the shape of the tire is round and then you get this very nice flowing line over the front one and even a bit more stretched over the rear one, there's this kind of movement. It doesn't just look like a cookie cutter cutout of the wheel shapes. It's basically just a, a refined line. I mean, if you analyze it, it's probably one of the simplest shapes you can actually come up with because there's nothing complicated about the design. That's probably why you get this feeling that it is actually almost, you would call it a masterpiece of design because it's reduced in simplicity to about as simple as you can do a body shape. The flow of the line from the front to the back, your eye just doesn't stop and it's calm as it's going through. There are no hiccups, no jarring uh, creases. It's done like, like, like it's been painted on there by a master painter. You know, nice, sweet strokes, simple strokes, masterful strokes, controlled, beautiful. That rear end, all Ferrari. Again, if I had a choice of a elegant car to drive, something that sort of was this epitome of GT uh, elegance, I would go for this car. It's a bit out of my price range, but I think something like this would absolutely stop anybody in their tracks if they saw it coming. The next car is for me one of the most gorgeous Ferraris Ever. The designer of this car is a, a designer I, I respect immensely, Leonardo Fioravanti, who's done many, many stunning designs for Ferrari. And Leonardo was responsible for designing 
the Ferrari Dino 246 GT. Now this car is small, it's pretty, it's purposeful, and it's done, like I said, in a very small, tight package. But again, it is one of the sexiest looking Ferraris ever, and definitely one of the most iconic Ferraris ever. This car was actually not really pushed by Enzo Ferrari himself to be built, but it was more of a decision that they had to respond to the Porsche 911. This is actually the first mid-engine Ferrari, albeit it didn't have a Ferrari badge on it, which for reasons that some of us know, Dino Ferrari was Enzo's son who passed away in the late 50s. And this kind of commemorates Dino. So you will not see a Ferrari badge on this car. You will only see the Dino badge and there is no horse, no prancing horse on this car either. This car is one I could spend hours washing it because there's just so many beautiful surface transitions from the front to the back. Along the side, you can see that it's it's, it, it's, it's not just 100% voluptuous in the sense that there's tension because you need tension in, in, in voluptuous things. If you don't provide tension lines, it sort of starts to sag. What I really like is how they emphasize the headlights. Now you have these very voluptuous fenders, but the headlights are nestled within that shape there. It's just beautifully done. I prefer it with a lens over the top instead of just having to cut out. A very small, petite, pert mouth almost, just like that. So when I look at the Dino, there is no bad angle to observe it from. Every angle on the Dino is stunning. Now, typically we'll look at a car from the front three quarter when we walk up to it, just to sort of meet and greet and get to know the car. And then we'll walk around it and see it from other perspectives. But with, with the Dino, I think it's probably a three quarter rear perspective. When you look at the car from a rear three quarter, that's when you start to appreciate the, the uniqueness, I guess you could almost say of the, of the Dino, because there are parts that, like I said, aren't, aren't very unique but flows very well all around the car. But what I really love about the Dino is the back end of the car. Now you look at it and you see that kind of negative curve almost to the buttresses that come from the roof down to the tail. If you look at it from the side, you can really start to appreciate it. The A pillar comes up over the roof and then through the, 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 the flying buttress, or not flying buttresses, but the buttresses on the back, they'll start to do a negative, slightly negative curve like that. And that kind of brings in a little bit more tension also to the design, works very well. There's, there's nothing in this car I would really, you know, criticize, except that basically I'm looking at a supermodel of a car. It's not the tallest uh, girl on the uh, catwalk, uh, probably not the most sensually shaped, but she's perfectly proportioned and you know she's got that that aura that just makes your your jaw drop when you when you come you know within 10 feet of her it's just uh, an awesome thing to look at and and who would not want to take a car like this home for the rest of its life or your life and have it have it close to you day you know on a daily basis this is one of the ultimate cars in the world So there you have it. Those are my my three favorite designs for a Ferrari. You know, everybody has a favorite Ferrari. So let me know in the comments below which are your three favorite designed Ferraris. Not necessarily from a technical aspect, but from an aesthetic value. If you're interested in any of my Ferrari drawings that I've uh, done, you can check those out on my website or in the link below. And you're free to, to purchase any of them. And I can also personalize them for you so have a look at them and if you're enjoying this be sure to subscribe because we're going to continue doing my three favorite designs of all the different car companies i can think of thanks so much for watching and i'll see you in the next episode